Greetings. I am Nitish Mukhopadhyay, Professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores. Welcome to the series, The Films of Distinguished Statisticians. This is a joint program of Pfizer Global Research and Development, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores, and the American Statistical Association. The funding helps us to invite the most distinguished statistical scientists to our university. It also allows us to film the Pfizer Colloquia and Conversations for the archive of the American Statistical Association. Before we begin the 23rd colloquium in this series, with deep gratitude, let me mention two colleagues, late Professor Harry Poston and Dr. David Salzberg. Late Professor Poston and Dr. Salzberg had engineered this program more than 35 years ago. The first film in this series was launched in 1978. I feel proud to introduce this 23rd Pfizer Colloquium in honor of Dr. Salzberg. The colloquium will be presented by Professor Pranav Kumar Sen from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Molloy Ghosh from the University of Florida at Gainesville. He will introduce our distinguished presenter, Professor Pranav Kumar Sen. Now, here is Professor Molloy Ghosh. It's my great Pleasure and honor to introduce Professor P.K. Sen, Kerry C. Bolsener, Professor of Biostatistics in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Professor Sen is also a faculty of the Department of Statistics and Operations Research. Professor Sen received his bachelor's degree from the University of Calcutta in 1955, the master's in statistics from the University of Calcutta in 1957, and PhD in statistics also from the University of Calcutta in 1962. He taught for three years at the Calcutta University, 1961 to 1964, and then moved to the University of California at Berkeley in, um, in the year 1964 for one year. And in 60, 1965, he moved to University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and he has been there ever since. Professor Sen's research in nonparametric statistics and virtually every area of statistics is simply outstanding. He has been elected a fellow of the American Statistical Association, a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, elected member of the International Statistical Institute. But that's only a subset. And he has too many honors and awards, but I will at least point out a few of the highlights. Professor Sen's honors and awards are, of course, too many, <laughs> as I said. He received the Charles University Prague Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Statistics in 1988, the McGovern Teaching Award from the School of Public Health UNC in 1996, Commemoration Medal Czech Union of Physicists and Mathematicians, 1998, Senior Noita Scholar Award from the American Statistical Association in 2002 for his lifelong achievement in research and teaching nonparametrics. 2010, ASA presented the prestigious Samuel Wilkes Award to him for outstanding contributions to statistics and biostatistics research and exceptional service in mentoring doctoral students. 2011, the International Indian Statistical Association conferred on him a Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2012, UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health's John E. Lurch Jr. Mentoring Award. And finally, again in 2012, Professor Sen was conferred the honorary DSC degree by his alma mater that is the University of Calcutta. P.K. Sen visiting professorship in biostatistics and statistics at UNC has been created by his family and friends, which was approved with matching state fund from UNC Board of Trustees. This professorship began operating effective 2011. The Sen family also created Kalyani Sen Scholarship for international students in UNC biostatistics effective 2011 in the memory of Professor Sen's mother. Now I'd like to introduce Professor Sen 
and the title of his talk is going to be A Pedestrian's Lost Horizon in the Wiener World of Statistical Science. Professor Sam. With my tender foot in statistics, I had a pedestrian's lost horizon into the Wiener world of statistical science. In this pilgrimage to the statistics Sangrila, I have witnessed some global perspectives in teaching and research, along with the ASA IMS differential, and mingled with the transformation of biometry to biostatistics to bioinformatics. At this stage, at this huge interdisciplinary field, the role of statistics is defined, but we need to have much more assertive role in interacting with the people in the various disciplines. And that's really one of the major part of my presentation today. Now coming back to my early life, I have my education all through from matriculation to PhD in Calcutta University. I was aspiring for the medical degree, so I got into an intermediate science program which had the provision of going over to the medical college. Unfortunately, for various reasons, that didn't work out, and I had to apply for general Bachelor of Science program at the Presidency College, Calcutta. I was both in the mathematics and physics honors program. At that time, a friend of mine, he suggested that I should do something with statistics. So I met with Professor Anil Bhattacharya, head of the Department of Statistics in, in Presidency College, Calcutta, and he encouraged me very much to come over to statistics program. And that's the chancy entrance to statistics in my college days. Now I realized that the Presidency College was the primary source of statistics program in India until about 1955 or so. Professor P. C. Mohalanavish, who was the founder of statistics in India, he's, he was the principal of the Presidency College too. And much of the development in statistics during the preceding two decades, that took place in the courtyard of Presidency College, Calcutta. So we are really fortunate to have that, have that uh, uh, patronage and that feedback, and I'm really humbled to be a part of that evolution process, although I came in a much later time and in a much more uh, modest way. Coming back to Presidency College, our teachers, Anil Bhattacharya, Birendranath Ghosh, and Prashad Banerjee, they were very dedicated for teaching, and they really did a superb job in our having the total comprehension of the subject, and it's enormous scope for applications. Speaking of applications, the Mahalanavish mantra was to promote methodology to interact with all applications in forestry, in agriculture, in industrial statistics, excepting perhaps in health sciences that I will come back later on. Now, after finishing my, our, my uh, BSc program, I moved on to the MSc program in the, in the same university just across the street, and we have new professors with, along with Professor B. N. Ghosh and P. K. Banerjee. We have Professor M. N. Ghosh and Professor H. K. Nundi, and of course, the head was Professor P. K. Bosch. The training we got at the MS level was really most inspiring. We have more methodology and more application, and in that way, we started to look in the statistics profession as a very interactive and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary field of research. After passing the MSc exam, I thought that I would go to the Indian Statistical Institute for my doctoral training, but for some reason that didn't materialize and I came back to my alma mater, Calcutta University. Those five years, from 19, roughly from 1957 to 1962, that was the time I learned more of statistics in research from my guru, Professor Hori Kinkar Nundi. At that time, we were three persons, Professor Shoti Chatterjee, a year ahead of me, Professor 
Joint Ghosh a year later than me and I was a sandwich in between uh, two giants, Shoti Chatterjee and Joint Ghosh. The most interesting part is that we had different topics of research all propped up by our own conviction and all we worked with the con considerable help from our mentor, Professor Horikin Nundi. Now, during that time, I had some interaction with him, but I could feel how much he influenced our line of thinking, mode of independent thinking and all sorts of developments that should have been the case with research scholarship in Calcutta University. Now, after I graduated in 1961-62 from Calcutta University, I joined the Calcutta University for three years and during that time, Professor Nundi and I had some joint work together and that I will come back later on. Now, during 1961 to 64 in Calcutta University, I was really fortunate to have three things. Number one, I was asked to teach bioassay in 1961-62 and at that time, I noticed that the whole curriculum on bioassay was based on normal tolerance distribution. Unfortunately, it happened, it so happened that those estimators which is ratio of two means are not invariant under any monotone transformation and setting up of a confidence interval could be even more difficult. So, I was trying to do something and it occurred to me that the rank test can be used to do that in a more meaningful way. And that is what the 1963 bioassay paper which obtained the estimator of the relative potency based on the Wilcoxon statistics. And secondly, in 1963, I did some joint work with Professor Horikin Nundi on U statistics in finite population sampling and that worked out also quite well in a much more broader setup. Of course, coming back to U statistics and order statistics, I have to mention that my first publication was in Moments of Sample Quantized in 1959 and it was something extension of hoteling and choose result in 1955 in the annals of mathematical statistics. And subsequently in 1960, we considered the case of structural convergence properties of U statistics, which was in fact the first spark of jackknifing of U statistics. And later on, some people developed that in 1965 or 66, but this is the paper in 1960 which started this whole setup. Now, the other thing is that in 1963, Professor Shoti Chatterjee and I, we started in collaborating work on multivariate nonparametric statistics. In fact, the rank permutation principle which we developed that paved the way for a big volume of multivariate research which I continued on my coming to United States in 1964 and onwards in Chapel Hill. First thing I would like to say that this uh, 1964, I got three offers, one from University of California, Berkeley, the second one from Lehigh University, Pennsylvania and the third one from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The Berkeley offer came just a few days before and I accepted that, but I informed Professor Greenberg in Chapel Hill that this is the situation. He said, no problem, you come to Berkeley and we will have you from there next, uh, next year. And that is the way after spending a year in Berkeley, I was in Chapel Hill in 1965 August and it is more than 47 years I am still there. Now, coming back to Chapel Hill, which I still regard the Shangri-La of statistics in my own way. And when I came to 19, uh, Chapel Hill in 1965, first thing I observed that it was a unique combination of mathematical statistics in Phillips Hall and biostatistics in the School of Public Health. Fortunately, I was in both the program. And these programs are vibrating, interacting and top in the field in that, in that, at that time. So, realizing my 
difficulties in continuing with the work on multivariate nonparametric methods. Professor Greenberg, he suggested that we could do some collaborative work and I am fortunate to have Professor Madan Puri who came over in 1966 summer and 1967 summer each time for 4 months and that started working on the uh, extension of multivariate nonparametrics to more general problems. But fortunately, uh, I also could continue with my bioassay works and, and, and the for general linear models in the same way as I did in Calcutta in 1963 and 62. At that time, I could say that the development of biostatistics using nonparametric tools that was in full swing and the development of multivariate nonparametric methods that was also in full swing. But unfortunately, Professor Chatterjee was not in Chapel Hill and so part of the work which was which should have been credited to Professor Chatterjee, Professor Puri and I we had to carry out in that way. And the book on multivariate nonparametrics that came up in 1971 from Wiley and we are very happy about that development. Now, late in 1960s, we observed that most of this stuff in, in uh, nonparametric methods, we do not have sum or average of independent random variables. That made it difficult to pursue large sample theory or asymptotic methods in nonparametric statistics. One thing we developed in the late 1960s and early 1970s is a rank statistics and U statistics basic structure namely martingales and sub martingales and reverse martingales. They could be applied very consistently for a general class of rank statistics. Now that led to the initiation of sequential nonparametric methods and that is we continued for a number of years. On the other hand, in 1971, 72, we got UNC Chapel Hill at a big NHLBI grant on lipid study. That means, what is the effect of lowering the cholesterol in blood, in blood level to 15 points and thereby reducing the risk of heart attack by the same amount. And Professor Chatterjee was visiting us in North Carolina during January to December 1972 and at that time we got this challenge from that project, lipid project. We observed that it is a time sequential nature that means everything depends on the successive failures and the tagging of the failures to the, success, the placebo or control group or uh, treatment group. And that is the way we started to think of what could be a reasonable way of getting into that statistical problem. Unfortunately, some other people they started working completely on computers which did not have any theoretical justification. And we observed that we could do something on using the invariance principles in a time sequential setup and that led to the development of time sequential nonparametric procedures. Now at this stage I would like to mention one thing. Number one, most of the people in statistical science, they may regard the Neyman Pearson lemma as the eye opener, while the greater number of people in American Statistical Association, they think R.A. Fisher is the founder of statistical science. Now, with all due respect to Fisher and Neyman, what I like to say that Abraham Wald was no less an avatar in that respect because his contribution to large sample theory, statistical decision theory, sequential analysis, everything is top rated and his contribution to nonparametrics is no less than anyone else. And secondly, when we started working in this invariance principles, the primary concern was Brownian motion, Brownian bridge and all sorts of things. And we noticed that the other one, Nobert Wiener, he is, he was a pioneer in this field of cybernetics 
and uh, thermodynamics and heat equations and probability and stochastic processes all sorts of things. So, what I could do? I could really appeal to the combination of Wiener and Wald. Now, literally Wiener means something which is of Vienna origin and Wald is this connotation for Kiefer, uh, Kiefer or Woods in German language. So, this is the statistical Wiener world I was trying to move into in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And this is of course, far from the real Wiener world which is surrounding this beautiful city of Vienna. Now, in the 1970s, the joint work with time sequential procedure, non-parametric sequential procedure, that kept us busy for about a decade. At that time, I had many, many advices and colleagues who started working in it, and much of these developments came up in the 1981 monograph sequential non-parametric invariance principles and statistical inference. Now, in the 1980s, because of this, what happened? I got more and more interested in the applications of non-parametric and sequential non-parametric in real problems of bioassay and biometry and biostatistics in general. In 1983 or 82, Professor B. K. Ghosh, my longtime classmate in Calcutta, and I, we were able to initiate a journal, Journal of Sequential Analysis, which has this motto of combining parametric, non-parametric, sequential methods, and stressing its applications in all respects. Now, uh, I am fortunate that we could continue that job for about 10 to 14 years and then handed over that to Professor Molai Ghosh and he has that job for about 8 years. And later on, Professor Nitish Mukhopadhyay, he has been doing a very good job on sequential analysis. So, I would like to say that in that context, we have also a handbook of sequential analysis in 1991 and that was something which served the purpose very well. Now, one reason for my staying over in Chapel Hill during 1970s and 1980s and onward was Professor Greenberg. He mentioned one thing very clearly that we need someone who could develop the methodology and the people who are his colleagues can use that methodology in their biostatistics application. This was the greatest compliment I could have from a person whom I regard as my own elder brother. And that is why despite of many, many opportunities to move out of Chapel Hill, I decided to stay on. Unfortunately, Professor Ginberg passed away in 1985 and in fact, in 1981, the Carey C. Bossheimer professorship I got was mainly due to his effort and I am really indebted to Barney and his wife Ruth for that. Now, essentially what happens? In biostatistics, we have a unique opportunity of combining the statistical methodology and fruitful applications in various fields, biomedical and agricultural and all sorts of other uh, health related problems. In that context, the primary thing was it, it needs to be developed on a new approach. For example, in most of the sampling scheme, in biostatistics, we may not have equal probability sampling. Unequal probability sampling, successive sampling, uh, probability proportional to sample size, all those things were, were in, the, in the picture. So, in that context, we have to develop something in sampling and using some invariance principle too. And part of that came up in 1970s and part in 1980s. Now, one thing what was very clear that to implement these things in biostatistics, we need considerable help from computers. At that time, the computers were not as much developed as now, but at least the methodology we developed, some of my colleagues could use that in that way and propagate the things much better. Now, the most significant thing is that during that study, we observed that 
the standard statistical methods may not be applicable. So, we need to appeal to non-standard methodology and in that respect couple of things came up. Number one, instead of standard parametric, we could use some standard non-parametric, but still that has some limitation. So, what we try to do? We try to use robust method and Professor Iana Jureshkova, she was visiting Chapel Hill in 1980 for six months. During that time, we took step in incorporating more robustness in statistical inference and we had long work and it is still continuing after 30 years. And during that process, we have a big monograph on robust statistical procedure in uh, interrelations and asymptotic methods that came up in 1996 from John Wiley. The other point was that I have been teaching this large sample theory course in Chapel Hill from mid 1970s all on onwards to about 2000. And in that course, uh, some of this stuff we put in a monograph, large sample methods in statistics with Julio Singer and that came up from Chapman Hall in 1993. The other significant development is the resurrection of the Pittman measure of closeness in the mid 80s going on to sequential case, going on to Bayesian case and in particular the Bayesian Pittman closeness measure which Malay Ghosh and I developed together in the late 1980s or early 1990s. That has this significant thing that some of the arbitrariness of the non-Bayesian perspective can be, could be eliminated by using the Bayesian perspective and that is still an active area of research. Unfortunately, the characterization for multivariate distributions was little bit uh, ambiguous and at least now in the last two, three years it has been observed that that can be done under more general what is called the elliptically symmetric multivariate uh, distributions and that characterization is really helpful in extending Pittman measure of closeness in the other direction. Okay. Sequential methods, we have a sequential estimation problem and the book monograph came up in 1997 by Malay Ghosh, Nitish Mukhopadhyay and myself and that provided the various applications also in sequential analysis in many other problems. And much of this is being further carried out in the journal of sequential non sequential analysis and I would thank Nitesh Mukhopadhyay for doing that job with good alertness and good leadership. Now, <coughs> in the 1990s, apart from this monograph, I was becoming more and more clear about one aspect, namely in the parametric or non-parametric methods, the basic emphasis was on finite sample properties, particularly parametric procedures, admissibility, minimum risk, all sorts of things, they were addressing the issue of optimality in a finite sample setup and rigidity of the parametric methods. Now, it so happens that nowadays the small sample methods are not totally capable of handling other stuff which arises in large scale sample surveys, the large clinical trials and biomedical problems and all other things. So, in that respect, we had to go what is called beyond parametric. Beyond parametrics includes Bayesian methods, paramet non-parametric methods, semi-parametric methods, robust methods and I think with this battery of discipline uh, tools, we are able to handle this large sample part and applications part much more evenly than the simple parametric emphasis on it. And the development in sequential Bayesian stuff and uh, non-parametric sequential stuff and sequential non-parametric stuff, all these came together in a very nice and cohesive way. And it is really that's the satisfaction we have that whatever we think, we thought of doing in the 1980s. After 15, 20 years, it started consolidating in a very nice and unified manner. As a matter of fact, back in the 1970s, we did not have much hope that 
biostatistics and statistical methodology can be linked in a to, a to a greater extent by rigidity and by interpretation. But fortunately, many, many younger people, including several of our advisees, they were able to impart their mathematical brightness and background to developing statistical procedures even in a much, much more general manner. Now, the main problem with the current emphasis on high dimensional data or interdisciplinary research arising in bioinformatics, in genomics, in other areas is that we have a huge dimensional data set with a smaller number of sample observations. Maybe it is too costly, maybe it is very difficult to obtain those data set and the question is how would we apply statistical principles in that setup. And if we look into that setup in a little bit more detailed way, first of all the question is can we assume multivariate normal distribution in this setup. Even if we assume if the dimension is too high compared to the sample size, can we use any multivariate tool in that context. Thirdly, the particularly in pharmacogenomics, in toxicogenomics and in bioinformatics, data mining perspectives are very overwhelming. So, the question is with data mining, can we simply say that resampling tools like bootstrapping, boosting, bagging, all sorts of things can they be used indiscriminately or we should be able to do something which has more statistical interpretation, more statistical motivation. Fortunately, in resampling plans there has been a lot of development during the last 20 years and they are capable of doing some much more interactive work in this developing field of uh, interdisciplinary research. But nevertheless, the question is still can we impart more statistical interpretation, more statistical motivation in that respect. Now, essentially if we look into that from a slightly different point of view, for example, in pharmacogenomics or toxicogenomics, we have to take into account the individual differentials in absorption, in excretion, in metabolism and in all sorts of reaction to external matter and that variation is 100 percent statistical. We cannot eliminate that variation. So, the, the main difference between data miners using purely computer tools and statistical perspective is that the data miners want to use some optimal statistical packages without possibly paying that much attention to the internal variation or intrinsic variation in the, in the comparable data set. So, essentially what the statisticians should do is to come up and interpret the genetics or genomic aspect in a chance mechanism and try to exhibit that it works out in a more meaningful and more motivated way. This is one of the basic reason why the conventional Neyman Pearson approach is not tenable in that setup. The other aspect is that even the world's decision theory or the winner process approximations, they are not really reliable in that field. So, essentially that needed something different. The most important thing we could try to think of, although the solution is not yet there, is that the conventional name and Pearson lemma being obsolete, we have to have something which along that line although we have FDR, false discovery rate and other measures, they are nevertheless not too powerful to doing it. One possibility is to use the Chen Stein 1975 theorem on the, on the Poisson approximation for dependent binary variables and that is promising, that gives us a more better way or more uh, the better way of handling that as much as possible. In fact, what happens is that what 
we could do is to use the Poisson process approximation instead of Poisson distributional approximation for this sequence of uh, sequence of dependent binary variables. I hope that that will pay, pay give us more uh, impetus in doing further work in this developing area. One of the other things which I would like to mention and that is something which is really not just for statistics or statistical science, but that is the way every academic field is changing. That is the teaching aspect and combination of teaching and academic research. Back in 1960s when I was a teacher in Calcutta University, our teaching load was more than what we have now. But still it was our pleasure because we were in academic field and we wanted to maintain that academic integrity, academic dedication through our teaching. And in that way, whatever financial support we had for our teaching was the main thing and spare time research and other things at our own. Now coming over to USA in Berkeley, teaching was also a part of my duty there, but I had more opportunity to do research there. In Chapel Hill, first couple of years I had less teaching, but then I took up teaching more and more including some of the courses which Professor S. N. Roy uh, used to teach who died in 1964 July. Now in that respect what I thought was in every department of mathematics or mathematical statistics every faculty member used to have a required number of teaching responsibility. But in biostatistics it was slightly more flexible because in biostatistics one of the major task was to interact with other public health and medical researcher and that for that reason we had little less in teaching but more time in academic and professional collaborative work. That worked out very well. But one thing was clear that the setup in statistics and biostatistics were somewhat different. So gradually in biostatistics the funding constraints came for promotional and for tenure decision and that started revolutionizing the whole field. Now what I see after almost 30 years in that way that if we have this development which puts lots of constraints on the younger faculty member to have money from outside, to have tenure decision based on that, to have promotion based on that uh, funding aspect, there is a big, big problem. Some of these teachers may not be able to teach the required number of courses. They teach maybe one course a year or at most one and a half. On the other hand, what would happen to our primary teaching problem. The program of master of science in biostatistics we used to have in Chapel Hill that was one of the best in the nation and most of our uh, students who graduated with a master's degree they were highly appreciated in their statistical professional work all over America. But that has changed not only in Chapel Hill but in most of the biostatistics program. The emphasis is now bring more money from outside and it is one of the things which the academic in, uh, environment should be concerned with. In fact what happens in some cases the teaching of core courses are given to non-tenured or research faculty people and that is something which we have to examine critically because it is the student whom the teachers could recognize through their teaching, it is the student whom they can pick up through their, through their performance in the, in the classes and it is the, is the student who can do also better job in their research or professional field. Now the fact is that the, the very way we are now putting emphasis on narrower areas eliminating other fields, it raises this question can we really justify this in a broader way? That means whether our graduates in even the PhDs are they equipped 
to work in collaboration with other non-statistical researchers, so that that can lead to effective collaborative work. Now, this is one of the fields, one of the facts, I think that this is a problem, could be a problem in America and elsewhere nowadays, because we are in academic institutions and in that way we need to have a solid commitment to our academic research, academic teaching and mentoring of younger, younger fellows or students and advisors. In that respect, just putting too much emphasis on outside funding and funding related research activity that could be contrary to the academic spirit. The most other significant fact is that many of the things which used to be done in IBM research laboratory, in office of naval research laboratories, in many other groups, Bell Labs and they still had a number of very distinguished statisticians or biostatisticians in that field. And the issue is that are we encouraging our PhD graduates to move more into academics or in a more balanced way in academics as well as uh, other research or uh, agency related jobs. Now, it is quite conceivable that in that way, we may not expect, especially in biostatistics, that all of them would prefer to go to the academic program. At least two-third of them may prefer not to go to academic program. They like to have after graduation going over some job and that has something to do with the tenure decision that is based on acquiring of fund, uh, outside funding and doing fruitful academic research. And secondly, this is also the question of whether it is better to have collaboration with these agencies like uh, Bell Labs or other groups and let them develop the statistical packages they need for their own applied research and let the universities provide some guidance to that instead of that having most of the things in statistics or biostatistics program themselves has this danger of moving the program to one side. For example, in many biostatistics department, we now have bioinformatics and genetics or genomics given the most prominent role because that has the more scope for acquiring money from outside. As a result, the classical program, the classical training part is shrinking. And in that setup, the question is, Without the classical understanding, can we expect the younger people to move into interdisciplinary field with more statistical interpretation or statistical motivation? If you look from that perspective, that many a time they are run by statistical packages. It's not the fault of data miners, it's the fault of ours. We need to put that emphasis in our training that we need conventional and classical statistical methodology to examine to what extent they are applicable or not in modern interdisciplinary research and then suggest that what we should do or we could do with research in those developing fields. This is one of the aspects I, I would like to say very sincerely that let us consider that part more seriously and as from academic point of view, we should examine what could be done and from industrial research or pharmaceutical research, we should also examine what they can do to make it more applicable in that respect. Now, this is one thing which I was thinking about this shift in research and teaching uh, norms over the past four decades and that is one of my major aspects to focus that let us try to preserve the academic integrity and academic excellence with due consideration of other staff in our day to day development. Interdisciplinary field is saturated with almost all disciplines like physics, computer science, biomathematics, uh, biostatistics, statistics, molecular biology of course is most important, 
and then pharmacology and then uh, toxicology all these are together. But in most of the cases the problems are non-standard and in one of the applications in environmental science problem with the, uh, uh, the uh, oxygen uh, dioxin compound in air pollution. We had some model where there are 17 compounds and the sample size were roughly about 15 and we could not use the usual multivariate analysis of various models. But fortunately what we could do, we could identify this model on a proportional scale which gives us the compositional data. In compositional data, it is more like the Dirichlet distribution. The negative aspect is that the covariance matrix depends on the mean vector in such a way that the covariance matrix becomes small and small if some of the proportions are small. And so, the usual multivariate normality based principal component analysis is not at all suitable. What we could do? We could use multivariate rank procedure and that worked out much better. And in this way, in each and every area we could see when to incorporate more non-parametric, more semi-parametric or more Bayesian methodology to complement the current way of routine use of statistical packages. The second point is that in most interdisciplinary research, it is statistics not in the driver's seat. It is the computer science because that is what the researchers want to use to have quick and ready-made answer but it is statistics which can provide statistical justification and interpretation and we need to do that in that way too. So, this is perhaps almost the end of the period I have and I would like to mention one thing that this has not been done over one day. Whatever we have tried to do over the last five decades, I am very positive that younger people and academic institutions will pay proper attention to the statistical implementation of all these tools in interdisciplinary research. And that is my strong uh, desire that let us try to follow that as much as possible. Coming back to the uh, conclusion, I would like to say that I have really enjoyed overwhelmingly the support from a large number of advices, colleagues and students in all our work. I have tried to implement more statistical interpretation and bridge the gap between methodology and fruitful application. I am not always successful, but I am hopeful that will work out much better. Now, in that respect, what happens? I had to sacrifice some time of my family life and others and I would like to thank my wife Gauri for her encouragement and for her understanding of my undertaking of this job. At the end, I would like to speak a few lines from Rabindranath Tagore adapted in my own imperfect way. My mind was scattered in thousands of places in the pursuit of thousands of selfish acts. I wonder how you collected the beans and put them in a string. I bow to thee who has bestowed sojourns of happiness in my life. I bow to thee who has inflicted incessant sufferings in my life. I bow to thee who lit the candle of love in my heart in the light of which I could perceive everyone alike. Whatever came in my way touched my heart and whatever has gone far away or fallen apart, I bow to thee. Knowingly or not, admittedly or not, I have realized thee that statistics in diversity is in every work of life and science and let me be an offered hibiscus in that light. Thank you.
Greetings. I am Nitish Mukhopadhyay, professor in the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores. Welcome to the series, The Films of Distinguished Statisticians. This is a joint program of Pfizer Global Research and Development, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut Stores, and the American Statistical Association. The funding helps us to invite the most distinguished statistical scientists to our university. It also allows us to film the Pfizer colloquia and conversations for the archive of the American Statistical Association. Before we begin this segment, conversations with distinguished statisticians in this series, with deep gratitude, let me mention two colleagues, late Professor Harry Poston and Dr. David Salzberg. Late Professor Poston and Dr. Salzberg engineered this program more than 35 years ago. The first film in this series was launched in 1978. I feel proud to dedicate a conversation with Professor Pranab Kumar Sen in memory of Professor Poston. I am delighted that Professor Molai Ghosh and Dr. George Williams would participate in a conversation with Professor Pranab Kumar Sen from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill about his life and work. Now, it is my great pleasure to invite Professor Molay Ghosh to take over the proceedings. Enjoy. Hello, I'm Molay Ghosh, Professor of Statistics at the University of Florida. On my left is Dr. George Williams from Amgen Biotech Company. And next to Dr. Williams is Professor B.K. Sen Kerry C. Balsamer, Professor of Statistics. We'll have having a conversation with Professor Sen, Professor Dr. Williams, and myself will be having the conversation with Professor Sen, and we are ready to start. Well, Professor Sen, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, please tell us about your early years, for example, in schools. Well, I was not born in a very affluent family, but it was quite okay to live with until my father died when I was 10 years old. And at that time, he was 40 years old, 40, 41 years old. So that put us in a little bit difficult situation. And the high schools, I was more sports-minded than studious in nature. <laughs> and my mother was very much concerned but ultimately, through her guidance, we made it. And in the early college, I was aspiring, based on my motivation from my grandfather, that I should go to the medical college. That's why I opted for a science program in intermediate stage. But for some reason, that didn't occur. So what I did, I applied to Presidency College for general BSc degree in and selected in both mathematics and physics honors program. At that time, a friend of mine, he came and he said that, explore statistics program. And I talked with Professor Anil Bhattacharya, the head of the Department of Statistics in Presidency College. And that was the chancy way I moved into statistics at that time. So in your uh, uh, stochastic autobiography, uh -huh. you refer to the stochastic nature of your entry into the field of statistics, and that's what you mean by that chancy way of getting into the field. I, I, I think that is correct. I think that is the motivation of that, and I use the word stochastic blowpipe. The, the, the main reason for using that word stochastic blowpipe, you don't know when a person is two, three, four years old, what would be his future or her future. Uh, you have to see that's step true. by step at each step, you have to have mm -hmm. a chance mechanism in the display, actually. Well, now I'll go to your college years, both your undergraduate and graduate work, uh, first in the Presidency College and then at the Calcutta University. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Thank you, uh, Mola. This is really a prime part of my, what I call, tender foot in statistics, in the sense that I was not planning to go to statistics, but I entered the statistics BSc program, honors program. And at that time, there were not too many colleges in India which had a statistics honors program. Possibly, the statistics honors program in other places started after 1955. 
the first 12, 13 years it was exclusively in Calcutta intensive college and textbooks were not that available, but our teachers Professor Anil Bhattacharya, Professor Bendranath Ghosh and P. K. Banerjee, they were so dedicated in teaching and so inspirational that I had no problem in taking their notes and studying with some other auxiliary books and going into the program. The more interesting program is that in India, the development of statistics started with Professor Mahalanabi's efforts and much of this development took place in Presidency College, Calcutta up to 1950-55. And at the same time, the Indian Statistical Institute that started in Presidency College, Calcutta then moved to the uh, Barakpur Trunk Road uh, 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 campus later on. And so we have a unique combination of methodology and application. And that is something which really appreciate because that completely anchored our outlook on statistics in our graduate studies as well as postgraduate studies and future life. So can you continue with that, your masters and PhD? Yeah, in a masters program, what happened? It is the some of these teachers, Professor Banerjee and Professor Ghosh, they were in our MSc uh, curriculum too. And in addition to that, Professor M. N. Ghosh, he was in a sense my real mentor at the master stage. And Professor Nandi, H. K. Nandi and P. K. Bosch were the chair of the department. They provided us the much needed inspiration and motivation for statistical science. In particular, I am very much indebted to both Professor M. N. Ghosh and H. K. Nandi. Now, after the master's degree, I tried for a little while in the Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta, for a pre-doctoral fellowship. For some reasons, again, that was again a big chance factor against coming to stochastics mm -hmm. that did not materialize. And so, I came back to Calcutta University, my alma mater, and I was most welcome there. And those five years, 1958 to 1962, 61, 63, that time, it was not only my research in statistics at the Calcutta University, but my growing up with the ideas of statistics, which fundamentally anchored my belief in the combination of methodology and, uh, and uh, application in statistics. This was unique in Calcutta at that time. And after coming to Berkeley or other places later on, we, we noticed that things were much more different here. But I really think that that is a very good thing to do. Uh, can you say a little bit more about Professor Nandi, your uh, sure. graduate advisor? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the prime part. <laughs> the thing is that after I started working with Professor Nandi, a year before Professor Shoti Chatterjee, he was also working under him. And a year later, Jayanta Ghosh, he also worked under him. We three were in a small room with three chairs and desk, no more room for anything else. <laughs> and, and, and but that smallness of the compound did not prevent us to think of something more. And that is really the guidance we got from Professor Nandi. He did not suggest our dissertation topics. Each one of us selected our own. And he said that it is feasible, go ahead and do it. And time to time he was offering all help, but the dissertation topics were non overlapping and completely cropped up by our own study and things. That is number one. And he had a very principal reason for that. You in develop your independent research capability, which is sometimes missing. Uh, in later days thing. Secondly, that when I started teaching in Calcutta University in 1961, just submitting the dissertation at that time, then I was asked to teach a course on statistical bioassay. Maybe Malai was in the next year in that program. 
Eh? Yes, I was in, the, in that biovasic course, yeah, which, yeah. which, and I took it from you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, at that time, you know, DJ Pini's book on statistical mm -hmm. biovasic, the standard book with exclusive emphasis on normal tolerance distribution, which is not normal in <laughs> biovasic <laughs> application. So I observed that the Wilcoxon statistics and median or science statistics could be used to derive that which has a nice property, it does not depend on the underlying tolerance distribution. Any continuous will do that. And we can use the exact confidence interval for that ratio of two means. And later on, many people, including Molloy and others, they work on the Bayesian aspect of Heiler's theorem. Yeah, mm. that's true. But the whole impetus came from that, actually. Mm. And that was the first time a rank estimator was used to estimate the ratio of two means. And I think that that started in Calcutta. And then before that, in 1959, I had a paper on moments of sample quantiles. This was due to a work by Hotelling and Chu in 1955 in the annals of math stat. They did for sample median in a very crude way. And I observed that the same thing can be done by quantiles, for quantiles, by using the tail probability, tail area yes. of the underlying distribution. And it does not need the moment of the underlying distribution. Mm -hmm. And that was well received outside at that time. And the second work was structural convergence of each statistic. And that was really the starting point of jackknifing of each statistic. Later on, in 1967 or 68, Arbison from Stanford, he was considering that uh, jackknifing, mm -hmm. and it was Jack Hall, who was my colleague at that time mm -hmm. in Chapel Hill. He said, "No, this is the work; it is already in in uh, in his 1960 paper." And Dana Quaid started teaching that in 1965, in uh, 66, in biostatistics. So when yes, you took the course right. in this thing, right. Dana Quaid included that <laughs> use statistics property in that in, in mm -hmm. your class actually. Mm -hmm. But it is more beyond that because in 1963, Professor Nandi and I, we had a joint paper on U statistic in finite population sampling, including the optimality of U statistic in that respect. And later on, in 1970, 72, I was able to use the weak convergence properties of finite population sampling mm -hmm. for U statistics also. So that has this root in the Calcutta. Very good. Uh, still thinking about the early choices, uh, at one point I think you've made a statement, uh, if I couldn't be a medical doctor, uh, I'd like to be a really good biostatistician. Could you comment on uh, why the reference to a medical doctor and then the biostatistician? I could say from an Indian perspective, because at that time in India, whoever used to go to medical degree program throw away mathematics. <laughs> mathematics is relevant for medical degree. Although one of the most noted physician in Calcutta, Biran Rai, he had a mathematics honors program and then he went to <laughs> medicine. <laughs> I say, that's <laughs> So yeah. when I say goodbye to medical degree and went to statistics uh, eventually, it was quite clear that I had some agony that whether medical degree I could ever get it. But at that time I had no idea about biostatistics because all we have is statistics and biostatistics had no relevance in Indian program at that time. So later on, as soon as I came to Chapel Hill, I realized that there is possibility, but I was lost how to change my emphasis from mathematical statistics mm -hmm. to biostatistics. And Dr. Ginba helped me a lot actually. And that's the reason Gradually it happened, it didn't happen overnight. It took 20, 25 years to come across that. And by mid 80s, I was more convinced that I have a role in the sense that apply methodology in application in non-standard problem. And that's where the biostatistics was heading to. And later on, it was more clear in that way. But I am imperfect, I cannot claim that. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. <laughs> uh, 
1964, you made a big decision to come to the United States uh, to go to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. That must have been a difficult decision. Can you comment on that transition? Actually, actually, 1962, I got the offer from Berkeley. And it was Professor Leka, who was the chair of the Berkeley Statistics Department. He sent that letter by air mail in early May. I got it in the middle of August. It went by surface mail, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that time it was the China, India, that skirmish on the uh, border. Right. <laughs> and, and so essentially I had to reply to him that look, in two to three weeks I cannot get visa and passport. I didn't have any passport at that time. He said, don't worry, I will invite you next year. But next year he didn't. <laughs> And then in 64, in May again, he sent that letter. And immediately at that time, I got another offer from Pennsylvania, uh, Lehigh University, and UNC Chapel Hill. But Berkeley letter came first. So I accepted that and informed Dr. Greenberg about that. The problem was coming from Calcutta to Berkeley was really a big and difficult step because I had no idea about academic life in United States. And the Berkeley department was full of statistical gods. And you cannot praise every god. You have to <laughs> choose, a, choose a sector and praise yeah. it. That was my problem. But it worked out OK. I learned a lot from there, actually. Very good. Well, uh, then, of course, you moved to Chapel Hill in 1965. And you have been there ever since, as I mentioned. Uh, but the point is, uh, you have written multiple papers. Mm -hmm. I've written multiple papers, and I would like to draw attention to one of your best cited papers. Mm -hmm. And the title is Estimation of the Regression Coefficient Based on Kendall's Tab. Uh, three days ago, I went to the Google Scholar and found 1039, 1039 citations. Can you say a bit more about the origin of that particular paper? I'm, I'm most happy to do that. In fact, the origin of that paper is 1963 biometrics paper, the di dilution bioassay problem. That was the two sample problem. And I was wondering if Wilcoxon two sample test can be used to get that. Some simple regression non-parametric statistics can be used to derive a similar estimator for the simple regression problem. And it turned out that the Kendall Stau is the right stuff for that. There we could get explicitly as the median of the divided ranges. Mm. And in the other case, in the two sample case, it is the median of the divided differences. That means yi minus xj, all over i and j, the median of those. So that was the main motivation. But also there was a paper on regression coefficient estimation using linear rank statistics by Adichie in 1967 and also. But that didn't have any explicit expression, closed expression. So what we like to do, we thought that this has one, the same property. You can have an exact conference interval. You can have a distribution-free point estimator. And that provided a lot of help to using non-parametric methods for bioassay, simple linear models, and other stuff. The couple of other papers appeared in ISI review uh, in 1970 and 71 or something like that. Now switching from papers to textbooks, uh, I remember very distinctly in 1971 reading uh, your a classic text now by uh, Madame Puri and yourself mm -hmm. on non-parametric multivariate analysis. Uh, I'm curious what the impetus for that work was? Uh, what led you to writing that text? Well, as a matter of fact, when we came to Chapel Hill in 1965, before that, Madan Puri was in Berkeley for the Berkeley Symposium for three weeks. During that time, he expressed a desire to work with me on multivariate non-parametric method. And I, I told Professor Greenberg, he said, no problem, you can invite him for the mm -hmm. summer of 66, when just before you came okay. to Chapel yes. Hill. And he was there also summer of 1967, in each case for four months. And it was 
during that time we realized that not to speak of multivariate nonparametric, there are not too many books on nonparametric methods even in the classical case. So, we thought that maybe we should start with the univariate part and gradually move over to the multivariate part. And that was the main reason of doing it, but the univariate part itself was something like 75 or 80 pages and but not covering all applications and then the multivariate part came. And during 1965 to 70, we have a lot of publication on multivariate part that we are able to incorporate in that book. And the whole point is that the multivariate nonparametric things started developing in Calcutta with collaboration from S.K. Chatterjee in 1963. And I wish that in some way the rank permutation principle which we developed in 1964 should be, should be, uh, I mean he should be a part of the whole development, but he could not come. I wish he could come and then we could have joined him also in that venture. Uh, after Berkeley, as you said, you came to UNC and have spent your career there since. Uh, you've in this conversation, you've referred to Bernie Greenberg, but I'm wondering about uh, if you could expand a little bit further on your relationship with Bernie Greenberg, Herb David, Jim Grizzle, individuals there on the faculty uh, at UNC. Well, as a matter of fact, when I came to Chapel Hill in 1965 August, it was Herbert David and Bernie Greenberg, they were the two persons who were in charge of my coming to Chapel Hill. With Herbert David, I could do some joint work. We have some joint work on paired comparison methods and other stuff and little bit on other statistics. But with Bernie Greenberg, I did not have any joint work, but he was always supporting me and finding out a way so that I could even do better. And the idea of bringing Madan Puri for two summers, it was Ginbak's idea. And then more than that, in 1970-71, I was almost about to come to Sunny Binghamton. And that gentleman, Macaulay, he wrote to Barney Ginbak that we are offering him such and such position. And Ginbak smiled and he sent a reply, very nice re reference letter. It is something like seducing my wife and uh, then taking the permission <laughs> after that. <laughs> <laughs> and Macaulay said, impossible. After that letter, I cannot have you here. <laughs> I say, you see, that's his way. He yeah. tried to help each and every faculty member in the department. I am not the only one. His recruitment, Larry Cooper, Dennis Gillings, all his recruitment, you know, Ron Helms, mm -hmm. uh, even Jim Grizzle, and more than that, uh, this, Ray, uh, this uh, Gary Cook, no, no, not Gary Cook also recruitment. Uh, I've forgotten his name. He was the person who did his PhD with R.C. Bosch, like Gary Cook. Mm. But before that, he was in doing work with Abraham Wald in, in Columbia. Roy Kibler. Roy Kibler. And he, mm. after R Abraham Wald died, he went to a small college in Pennsylvania and he was teaching there. And in one of the IMS meeting, R.C. Bose met with him in 1953 or 54. And then R.C. said, what are you doing? You have straight A under Wald and Wolfowitz. You cannot just go to a small college. Uh, and, uh, uh, uh. and so he brought him to Chapel Hill and asked Barney Ginberg, whether you can do something. He said, no problem. After he finishes degree, we will have him here. So that is the way and each and every faculty member, even Norman Johnson, when he came to Chapel Hill in 1962, his wife Regina, Gin wanted to put both of them in the same department, but it was not possible at that time, university rule. Yes. So Regina was in our department mm. and Norman went to statistics. Norman went to statistics. But Norman was more than anyone helping biostatistics in that respect, sampling theory, all this other stuff, and he was very interactive with biostatistics. And the other person was S. N. Roy. He had very good relation with Barney Ginberg, and in fact, my coming over to Chapel Hill 
was partially due to S. N. Rai and M. N. Ghosh. They offered the position to M. N. Ghosh. He could not come. Then S. N. Rai told that invite him. Mm -hmm. mm. So, Ginbak's generosity was extended to everyone, not me alone. But in my case, whenever I had a got a chance to get out, it was his thing that think of it, he will not do what's here, he'll do better here. And that was good enough to do something. In fact, you also spent a year after, after your my graduation. degree, it was a postdoc yeah, in the department, and yeah. that was also yeah. Greenberg's. <laughs> yeah. And Herbert David was also Generosity. invited. Yeah, that's true. Well, uh, now we are coming into the 70s. Uh, you became quite interested in the field of sequential non-parametrics mm -hmm. in the 70s, leading to, the, of course, the text, sequential non-parametrics, invariance principles, and statistical inference, also monograph. Mm -hmm. NSF CBMS lectures, 10 lectures, convert into a monograph. You also recognize the importance of time sequential statistical inference, a very important thing. Was there a connection between the, this interest and your collaboration with the UNC colleagues working on the Lipitz project? If so, please uh, mention the connection and the nature of the Lipitz project okay. as well. First of all, I would like to say that the idea of moving into sequential and parametrics is absolutely due to my connection with or involvement with Lipitz project. Before that, in the late 60s, after Molloy finished his PhD degree, during one year he was uh, working as a postdoc in biostatistics, we started working on invariance principles for non-parametric statistics. The one sample rank statistics, and we use some of these Martingale properties, etc. Correct. In 1972, I had something with uh, Roy, uh, with uh, uh, Ru David, uh, uh, Rupert Miller yes. uh, on invariance principles for U statistics, where right. you see reverse Martingale property mm -hmm. of the U statistics case. And in 1972, when the Lipid project was granted by NHLDI, National Health and that's Institute of Heart, Lung, Blood and Blood and Institute. Blood. And that was a 12-year contract. The idea was if somebody could lower the blood cholesterol level by 15 points, that person may expect a risk reduction of cardiovascular diseases by about 5 points. Mm -hmm. But how would you do that? It is the involvement with 3,952 human beings. They are otherwise healthy, but they are initially blood cholesterol level more than 240. And the placebo group was using some fake powder, retaining that. The treatment group, some cholesterol reducing drugs, which over the six months reduced to the 160 or less. And then following it up. Yes. And uh, Max Halperin and Jim Ware, they were using the computer to run, you know that yeah. that time yeah. we were there actually. Yeah. And Chatterjee was visiting Chapel Hill for one year. So we were able to do that and we developed these invariance principles for progressively censored linear rank statistics. And that's again the winner process approximation <laughs> and that set up the whole thing. But what more than that, I was involved about 20% of time from 1970 to 1982 or 83 in that Lipid project. And one after another advisee, they have their dissertation in that respect. And so I would say that without that project, it would have been really difficult for me to see why it is important to develop time sequential statistics. And in 1983, I think it was in University of Iowa, Bob Hogue uh, was able to have me as the NSF CBMS lecturer. And there also, I presented the sequential non parametric and time sequential non parametric at that time. Well, I was there also. To yeah, I was present, and mm -hmm. that was a very mm -hmm. useful conference for many. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember even Harrington and Fleming yeah. were yeah. also in that conference. Yes. As such. Uh, well, now we are getting into applications actually. Uh, in 1992, mm -hmm. UNC Institute of Statistics Mimeo series mm -hmm. manuscript, you noted that. 
Statistical science has its genesis in real applications, and during the past 15 years, we have been more inclined to research in biostochastics, environmetrics, bioinformatics, and we continue to pursue basic methodological research to bridge the gap between theory and application. Now, can you please comment on the relationship between theory? That's a very general question, not necessarily confined to all these no, areas no, no, no. which I mentioned. The, the relationship between theory and applications. The way I thought that, unlike mathematics, which could have very abstract theory or other development, in statistics, it should be methodology or theory with potential application. And in biostatistics, it is even more, because many of the things in biostatistics used to be done heuristically. That means, mm -hmm. this is roughly true for normal linear models. So, let us try it and let us do it with computer, uh, uh, I mean packaging and other stuff and see how far we can mimic that stuff. That has good value, but that needs the conjugation of good theoretical or methodological background. And that was the main purpose. Now, in doing that, the first thing we have to notice that the stochastic factor is the main factor in their development. That means, in every biostatistical problem, the underlying statistical undercurrents could be different in their own way. So, you need to modify the methodology in such a way that you have the right approach to analyze it, to design it, and to draw statistical conclusion. So, that is the way biostatistics or biometry, even if that started developing from that way, that has this relevance. It is not just I prove a very good theorem in mathematics mm -hmm. and say that this is okay. Um, and every time we try to do that, we had in mind maybe sometimes we could use it in biostatistics. You've referred to computation, mm -hmm. and certainly in recent years, uh, there's been a tremendous expansion of computational techniques uh, that applied statisticians are using yeah. a lot, whether it's simulation, bootstrapping, any of those kinds of methodologies. At one point in time, uh, you cautioned about unconditional surrender to the computer package. In fact, in a, a paper in the uh, Journal of Statistical Science 1991, you cautioned about the importance of getting the balance correct between computational techniques and a methodologic and understanding of the statistical principles that we were working with. And you said, uh, hopefully in a few years, we'd get that balance right. How are we doing as a field in this balance between computational techniques and understanding basic methodology? Okay, let me put it in a little bit different way. In this country, you have a constitutional right for rifles and other stuff. Does that uh, mean that you have to shoot every time? <laughs> I mean, some tools, computational tools are very powerful tools. There is no doubt of that. But generally, some of the people involved in practical applications, they may try to overdo that, sometimes neglecting the methodology and other stuff. But it is also our fault. We need to provide methodology which will justify those computer, computational algorithms or programs in that field. And it so happened that at that time there were not too many people who were willing to take that initiative to bridge the gap between sound methodology and good computational algorithms to apply that. As a matter of fact, in my own case, the multivariate nonparametrics we developed, the methodology was okay, but its application came up much later on. In fact, uh, Frank Harrell had some mm -hmm. program in SUGI, SUGI, S-U-G-I, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, multivariate, multi-rank procedure, something like that. And now, after that, you started. And this was one of the reasons when Chatterjee and myself, we developed that invariance principle for this. It was in 1973, Correct. Just, a, just about few months later than D.R. Cox's seminal paper on uh, life table and regression. But 
the packages were not developed that early. Mm. So that's where I thought that there is a gap between adoption of methodology mm -hmm. in practical areas and that started developing more and more, but at the expense of Cox model. Cox model is certainly the eye opener and it's really very, very seminal paper. But there are many, many problems where yeah. the proportional hazard assumption Model. is that. And one simple example in 1986 or 85, we have a team from NIH who are studying, this is the ascending aorta, and in senior age, I belong to that age now, <laughs> it can be <laughs> clotted, it can be clotted with lipids or other solid fatty substance. So either you put a diluted dilutant which will gradually reduce the level or you have a surgery which takes out that. Mm. Now the if, the if the dilutant is successful, it gradually decreases the risk like that. The surgery case before the surgery it goes up and then suddenly drops and then continues in its lower level. These two risk function cannot be proportional. Yes, and, <laughs> and, very clearly. Yeah, and, and, and they were arguing that they have used uh, uh, statistical packages for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the Cox model. I say yes, that you can do, but I know that this assumption is not correct. So try to do something, and then Susan Murphy, uh -huh. her dissertation, I said Susan, you can work with regression coefficients dependent on time, <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and, and yeah. so in in that way, she was able to do something more. And Alan Carr, he was also working on that. And in the late 90s, in the 89 or 90, uh, 90, 1990, it was at least some solution. And after that, many, many people have worked on that uh, time dependent regression coefficient oh, in Cox model. And that was something which is really out of this experience, actually. Although I didn't develop any computer package, but Susan and others, they were also able to contribute to that field in the 1990s, and that worked out quite well. Uh, you've been v interested, as uh, we've been talking here, about interdisciplinary research, the, mm -hmm. the uh, field of biostatistics, its relationship to these uh, applied areas. You've coined a phrase, uh, beyond parametrics, and it includes uh, non-parametrics, semi-parametrics. What were you trying to accomplish with uh, coining that phrase, beyond parametrics? Well, essentially, if we start with non-parametric, in the early 50s and 60s, it was basically based on ranks or U statistics approach. That started changing in the 1960s because many of the things were then tied down to empirical processes. And in multivariate empirical processes, not all statistics could be rank statistics. Even Kolmogorov mean of statistics had that mm -hmm. In the multivariate case, are the difficulty because with the marginal rank or the joint rank and so on and so forth. So essentially, non-parametric started evolving, mostly having also a large uh, asymptotic component, asymptotic theory component. Mm -hmm. In s small samples or moderate sample sizes, the computations could have been prohibited. So there is the necessity of going something which fortunately in the 79, 80 and onward bootstrapping methods paved the way. But one of the major advances was not semi-parametric method or non-parametric method, but the empirical base, hierarchical base, they have the flexibility to also do something to diffuse that. And those three components, or four components, non-parametric, semi-parametric, robust procedure, and Bayesian procedure. That's what I thought would be called beyond parametrics. In fact, some of these improper priors, the vague priors they use, that really brings to us relevance, that we are allowing the prior to be quite flexible mm, to incorporate some robustness in that respect. And last 15, 20 years, there's been tremendous work on Bayesian stop in that business as well. Well, now I'll move to your list of publications. Uh, 
you have more than 600 publications. You have authored or co-authored 14 books and monographs and edited or co-edited 12 more. That's the work of possibly <laughs> several statisticians, joint work of several statisticians. I don't know how many people can really achieve this feat. And my question is, how do you find time for these things? That's amazing for me. Well, well I, I am in the profession for more than 50 years. Uh, it is really the 50th anniversary of my getting PhD degree. So it was not done overnight. And secondly, I was comparatively younger <laughs> in the 60s and 70s, 1960s and 70s, more energy at that time. But more than that, I had a large number of very energetic and active younger colleagues and advisors like you, and all of you have contributed to that development. And in, in, on top of that, some of the areas are developing areas. And there were not much unification of the research done in that system, particularly the sequential non-parametric stuff. That replaced the development in 1970s, and it came up in 1981. Okay? After that, the semi-parametric methods started develop, uh, evolving when Bustiatis and uh, uh, this person, Chris. Uh, uh, Nels, Nels Keiding and others, Alan oh, Anderson and Alan um, with the Berkeley PhD, Alan Goot or something, they really, or Alan, hmm? they, they Odell. really developed the semi parametric procedures using the Cox model but going into a stochastic process approach <laughs> using the empirical or weighted empirical survival functions actually. And that started developing the field in 1980s, but in the 70s, they were not there. Ford Allen's paper appeared in 1979 or 78, and Neil Skiding even later on, and Gill, Richard, Richard Gill, mm -hmm. his is 1981 or 82 around that time. But what we observed that the same old jackknifing technique we, we had earlier, and Tuki is the founder of that, that could be used even in such complex functional estimation procedures. So essentially, in a way, the beyond parametrics include all those developments. It has good non-parametric component, but in, s in addition to that, semi-parametric, robust procedure, and Bayesian procedure, or hierarchical Bayesian procedure, they all came under the same set. Speaking about volume of work, uh, it's impressive. 84 doctoral students, uh, a, a tremendous interaction with doctoral students that you've had. Uh, I know you prioritize teaching very highly. Uh, you're concerned about uh, developing uh, uh, tools for that teaching, uh, interacting with students, mentoring students. Can you reflect on the importance of teaching? Well. This is a very good point, George. The point is that you know better the students through your teaching, and they know you better. And that interaction can only develop if you have taught a course or two to them, and then they see whether that would be their interest too. Now, in 1965-66 onwards to about 1975-80, what happens in math stat department, there was a vacuum. S.N. Roy died and R.C. Bosch went to Fort Collins and so on and so forth. And there were a number of students who wanted to do work in statistics, not in applied biology or communication theory or design of experiment and so on. So many of them, through my teaching of multivariate course there, they were attracted to it. And at one time in 1976, 77, at that time, I had three from statistics and three from biostatistics. 
and all, almost all of them are working on sequential nonparametrics or sequential parametrics or sequential other statistics. Uh -huh. And uh, for example, Van Chinchili, mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, his name is Chong, Wai Chong, and Ying Sho from statistics, and Elizabeth DeLong, Frank Harrell, and uh, uh, then Agam Sina from biostatistics. It was a it was a con considerable load, but I, I really enjoyed that. Because again, the same thing appeared in 1990s. In biostatistics, we had a large number of faculty who used to do more, uh, more project work. Uh -huh. But when it came to supervising doctoral students, they may not have, might not have good amount of time, or they have other commitment. And Larry Cooper was in charge of the training grant. But he guided very few. So it was the student who came to us, mm -hmm. and we had to say, all right, we'll do that. And in some cases, I had took the help from the younger faculty member for co advising. That is a part of the mentoring of the younger faculty member. But at that time, it was possible because, irrespective of the funding resources, somebody could work with somebody else. But now that rule is changing. That rule is changing, and that has made it, in a sense, it's better let the younger people do it. And I gradually moved myself away from that, I mean, competition in that sense, so that let the younger people do that. But the difficulty is that many a time, if they have a small, narrow area of expertise, they may not appreciate the whole field in that way. But it's really the student or advices who came to me. I didn't want to, but I'm happy that I could be of some use to them. But many of them, including both of you, have been very hardworking and innovative. So that really help, helps a lot, actually. Well, uh, you have been teaching statistics for a long, long time, several decades, as you said. Uh, what about your view now? A need for global perspectives and transformations in statistics teaching and research. Mm -hmm. Should we change our teaching <laughs> this, curriculum? This is, or this, this, this is a really very hot topic. I mean, as I said that when we moved to Chapel Hill or before that in Calcutta, every faculty member in MathStat had to teach a number of courses maybe three a year or four a year, that was the standard rule at that time. In Biostat, it was little less because they have the obligation of collaboration with others. But after coming to Chapel Hill, I picked up teaching some of the courses in that department. And then I started teaching in Biostat with blood sample theory and sometimes other statistics or non parametric statistics for a while. But the, the point is that this teaching is an integral part of the whole thing, an academic profession. But the funding situation was so convenient, it used to be given to the department. Training programs were given to the department, although formally with somebody as PI. Huh. But regarding the training part, it was open to all the faculty who were capable of doing that. That rule has changed. changed. Mm. Yeah. Now, individual people who have good grants, they can support the student, and they have to work with them. Mm. So that's number one. Number two, what happens? Every faculty member, tenure track or not, need to have, have a sizable amount of support from outside funding. Even the even the tenure track people. Uh -huh. mm. So, from the very beginning, we are putting pressure on them to acquire more funding from outside. How do you take that? They have to sacrifice teaching. They have to do research, particularly related to the outside funding sources, and that is changing the academic situation. The people in academia. They don't have that, may not have that much time to do academic research, particularly in biostatistics. 
And secondly, this outside funding is creating a lot of differentials in salary, in recognition, in teaching and everything. So I want that in some cases the core courses in biostatistics are being offered by research track faculty or adjunct faculty for the same reason because the tenure track faculty in spite of their support from the state fund to a greater extent they would like to have more more support from outside so that they could have better remuneration and other other purposes it's not unusual but the level of discrimination has reached a point mm -hmm. where the academic spirit academic integrity may be compromised to a greater extent well uh, related but slightly different i was thinking about a transformation of the curriculum or something like that but yeah. in the same vein uh, two stalwarts norbert wiener and abraham wald mm -hmm. i'm it is kind of joke but i'm saying uh, wondering whether they are lost in the horizon of statistical science, lost in the sense that people think, well, Abraham Wall, we don't need Abraham Wall's decision theory <laughs> anymore, uh, or something I, I like could that. Not, I could not make that bold <laughs> statement that we don't need Abraham Wall. Some people <laughs> meant, uh, no, they didn't say that. They said we don't need Minimax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's like the that. whole point. That's yeah, the whole point like that, that we do not, I mean, the decision the, theory uh, the, the, is outdated. The, yeah, the difficult part is this. Why one would uh, use the classical tools or simple asymptotic method to complicated problems which are statistically or analytically difficult to tackle. So we submit it to submit it to data mining and resampling tools and other stuff. And in that process, sometimes they do not even recognize that the very uh -huh. definition of the sampling tool may be vitiated in that, in that complex. Uh -huh. So essentially, it is our responsibility to do that. Secondly, in many cases, the teaching and the curriculum is vastly affected by this outlook. Even in some cases, they do not want to teach probability theory at the math stat department using classical open sets and, and, and uh, say volal field sigma algebra these days because they said that nowadays is not needed. That means what they are doing, they are pursuing applied probability track. Okay. And in biostat, we are pursuing more data oriented stuff. And in this, in that complex, the classical stuff is sometimes missing from this thing. Even it is in the curriculum, they are not putting it in the core, po core courses. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to think, whether in interdisciplinary research, if we have to have more statistics in it, can we totally bypass that? We may have to do something to have something in that way, so that it is a meaningful interaction between statistical reasoning and data mining. And I think that that is the point which I was trying to say mm -hmm. that the curriculum change, teaching mm -hmm. preference and other stuff, they are all interrelated. Suppose I put this in your, in your setup. Suppose we have a graduate PhD from biostatistics and you want to employ in your group. What is your expectation about that person's role? Well, uh, in our situation in the pharmaceutical industry, to yeah. be specific, we need good, solid training in yeah. statistical thinking and understanding yeah. uh, in drug development. Who knows what the science will, where it will take you next week, next month, next year. Yeah. And we need to be able to develop that statistical thinking to attack those yeah. problems and not get overly specialized too yeah. early. Yeah. No, essentially, the problem is this. The utility from your perspective is one way. The, I mean, compatibility from graduate program in biostatistics or statistics in a different way. And what should be a demarcation line so that you can interact more? If it is simply implementing statistical packages, you need more technician, not PhD level 
personnel who should be able to do little more than that statistical interpretation, statistical reasoning and conclusion in a more valid statistical way. I think that that is the whole point right. in, my, in my saying that global perspectives in teaching and research because interdisciplinary research is very I mean prominent nowadays. Every department, every university has that thing, but we have to do in that setup. Well, now we'll go to the non-academic side. Can you uh, briefly tell us something about your family? I know your wife uh, for more than 50 years, or near 50 years, Mrs. Sen, for a long, long time. But can you say something about your family? <laughs> well, my wife and I, we are married for almost 50 years. It will be 1963 uh, to 19, 2013, 50 years. We have our daughter, Devadatta, she was born in 1966, and son, Aniruddha, he was born in 1973. None of them wanted to be a statistician. So <laughs> our daughter had the training in journalism. She was working for a while in Atlanta Constitution newspaper, mm -hmm. and now she's a freelance writer with three children, three daughters, and our son, he had speech communication in undergraduate and divinity in graduate studies. And he is now a pastor, a Christian minister, and he's doing quite well in Orlando area. Uh, and yeah, they have two, one, one son and one daughter. Yeah. So we are full basket, five grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, turning to uh, uh, non-academic aspects, although perhaps r academically related. I'm curious, do you have a favorite statistical book? Uh, uh, this might go back to uh, early years of your training. Uh, uh, any favorites in that regard? Well, when we were in the MSc class, I think at that time just the book of C.R. Rao in 1952, Advanced Statistical Methods in Biometric Research came up and I, I got a copy of that. And there was also the book of Harald Kramer, Mathematical Methods and Statistics. That used to be available in the department library. So these are the two books we read. Mm -hmm. And Kendall and, only Kendall, not Kendall and Stuart. Yeah, Kendall. That was there in 1956 or 55, the first edition. Mm -hmm. So these are the three books. But much later, we were exposed to other books. And of course, that was not during our college days. But after coming over here, we got more. In fact, we have to copy Eric Clement's 